Welcome students. In this video, we are going to talk about the Vesper theory as well as molecule polarity. So let's dive right into the Vesper theory. Vesper theory sounds big and scary because it stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, but really it's quite simplistic. What it says is that there are electrons in bonds and also electrons that make up lone pairs, and that these pairs of electrons, whether they're bonded pairs or lone pairs, don't want to be anywhere near each other. And so what they do is they spread out to get as far apart from each other as possible because electrons repel each other. So if we look at these pictures in the middle of our page, what I'm showing here is a central atom in black and then two bonded pairs of electrons that I've highlighted in blue. And right now, this drawing is showing that my bond angle is 90 degrees. This isn't going to happen. The electron pairs that are in the bonds, what I've highlighted in blue, don't want to be close to one another. So they spread out to be as far apart from each other as they possibly can. And what that looks like is to have the pairs of electrons in the bonds be as far apart as possible, which is opposite each other. So notice how in my example on the right hand side, now these atoms are 180 degrees away from each other because the electrons that make up those bonds need to be as far apart from each other as possible. This idea continues to occur whether or not you have two groups of electrons around the central atom, or three, or four, five, or six. These molecules will create a very well-defined characteristic shape in order to get those pairs of electrons as much space as possible. We're going to go through the first a uh, couple of shapes where we're going to look at two, three, and four electron domains because that's what we usually do in organic chemistry. Let's start by talking about two electron domains. Electron domains are just groups of electrons, right? They're a location where electrons live. Some people might call them electron sets. Some people might call them the steric number. No matter what you call them, they are areas where electrons live. And we're usually focusing in on one atom. In general chemistry, you focused in on the central atom. As you expand to organic chemistry, you're going to look at any atom in a molecule, be able to count the number of sets around that atom, and see how many sets of electrons do I have and what's the shape around that atom. With our two domains, a domain is either a lone pair or in general chemistry, I like to call it an attached atom. So why do I call it an attached atom? Because here I have two pictures of examples of two electron domains. So let's highlight our central atom again. Here's one central atom, here's our other central atom. And what I want to make clear is it doesn't matter how many electrons are in that domain. What matters is that you're focusing on just an area where electrons are. So this bond has electrons, this bond contains electrons. That's two electron domains. In the other molecule, still we have one electron domain on the left, and this triple bond is one domain. It does not matter how many electrons are in the bond. If it's a double, a triple, a single, it's still one electron domain. And that's why, especially in general chemistry, it's probably easier to focus in on how many atoms you have attached rather than leading yourself into a situation where you can get confused about how many domains there are because you're looking at the number of times that atom is attached. So if we just focus on the atoms attached and the lone pairs, we can really uh, make sure that we don't miscount our number of domains. So these two examples are going to have the same electron pair geometry. Remember, electron pair geometry is looking at where the electron domains are with respect to one another. In this case, they're opposite one another, and what they're doing is they're making a line. So here is my uh, geometry for my linear structure. This is linear because what I'm holding is the central atom, and then I have one atom and one atom opposite those. 
Notice how they're making just one line. That's where we get that name linear from. If we look at our example again and we imagine that there's a circle around here, if we take a circle which is 360 degrees and we chop it in half, you get 180 degrees. So that's how we know that these are going to be 180 degrees away from each other. So our bond angle is 180. Let's talk for a moment about what molecular shape is. Other people will call this molecular geometry instead of molecular shape. And it's fine to call it molecular geometry. Actually, I think it's more widely accepted, but I like to call it the shape because the difference between the electron pair geometry and the molecular shape seems very minimal to students. So the electron pair geometry is taking into account all of the pairs of electrons or electron domains around that central atom. So if you're looking at your central atom, it's counting lone pairs and attached atoms the same. Whereas for molecular shape, the just the atoms are being looked at and where the atoms are with respect to one another. So it looks like the shape of the molecule. I find it helpful for students to just replace the word geometry for molecular geometry with the word shape, and they end up usually doing a little bit better. When you don't have any lone pairs on the central atom, your shape and your geometry are always going to be the same. This is going to be linear as well. When we end up looking at hybridization, what we need to do is focus on our central atom and count how many electron domains there are. Because you have two electron domains, you need to hybridize an S and a P in order to get two equivalent orbitals. So the number of electron domains that you have is the number of orbitals that need to be hybridized. And you always start at S because it's lower in energy, and then you add in the Ps. Remember, there's only three Ps. This is going to be an SP hybridization. Now let's start moving into three electron domains. For three electron domains, now what's going to happen is you have one, two, three attached atoms. And if we look at these three attached atoms, and I'm going to bring your attention to the screen again, and we just kind of uh, draw lines, it certainly looks like I just made a triangle. This is going to have the word trigonal in the shape's name. The other thing that this shape is going to say, and whether in this case the shape and the geometry are the same, is it's going to be trigonal planar. So why is it going to be planar? Well, if I turn my structure like this, do you see how all of these atoms are all in the same plane? If I were to put this on a table, my hand is close enough to a table, all of the atoms are going to touch the table. That means that all the atoms are in the same plane. So this is going to be called trigonal planar. Remember that when you don't have any lone pairs on the central atom, your electron pair geometry and your shape are the same thing. Now let's talk about the bond angle. If we look at our structure again, if I kind of imagine a circle around all of these atoms, a circle is 360 degrees. I take my circle and I split it into thirds. And when I split it into thirds, that takes my 360 degrees and turns it into 120 for each third. So the angle between one atom and another is going to be 120. For the hybridization, you have three electron domains, which means you need to hybridize three orbitals. So you take an S, a P, and a P, and you blend them all together, and you get SP2 hybridization. We're still going to look at three electron domains on the next slide, but we're going to take away one of the pairs of uh, electrons that's an attached atom and turn it into a lone pair. So let's look at this example where now with our three electron domains, one of our pairs 
of electrons is actually a lone pair and that's what this big red lobe is meant to illustrate is the lone pair. We still have one, two, three electron domains, right? We have three locations where there are electrons around the central atom. We will still have a trigonal planar geometry. As for the shape, this is where things change. For the shape, what you're looking at is you're looking at how the atoms are arranged. This lone pair, this causes a change in how the atoms are arranged. It does take up space. It is physically present. But if you kind of imagine like you're taking a atomic picture of your molecule, the electrons are so small they don't show up in the picture. So what shows up is the atoms. And so this part that I'm holding on to, this big red part that's your lone pair, won't show up in your picture, but it's still causing these atoms to be kind of closer to one another. And now what we see in this shape is it's um, more of a bent kind of shape if we look at it. Some people might call it V-shape, and I'm going to twist it around. And you can see why some people might call it a V-shape is it looks like a really wide V. This is going to be bent. Now what about that bond angle? You still have three electron domains. When you have those three electron domains, those electron domains are still around 120 degrees away from each other. But the thing is, is see how much bigger this lone pair is? Here's your bonded pair, right, where my, my two fingers are touching. So right here's your bonded pair. This is your lone pair. The model is meant to show that the lone pair is significantly larger than your bonded pair. It takes up a whole bunch more space, right? It's not that the electrons are larger, it's that there's no nucleus on the other side for the lone pair of electrons to be attracted to on the other side. So it's just swimming around, taking as much space up as it wants to. So what happens then when this takes up a whole bunch of space is it makes this bond and this bond come closer together. And so instead of 120 degrees between these two atoms that are left, it's gonna be a little bit less than that. And so it might be like 118. Some teachers will say, you know, uh, about 120. Some people will want you to say less than 120. And some people will want you to memorize the around 118. I'm perfectly fine if you are in my class to go ahead and say less than 120. So let's also look at the hybridization. Remember, you have three electron domains, so you need S, P, and P in order for each of those electron domains to have a place to live. The lone pair counts. You have to have a hybrid orbital for the lone pair. So this is going to still be SP2 hybridization. Now let's move into four electron domains. Four electron domains is where we start moving away from things that are planar into things that go into the, the third dimension. They become three, more 3D. In your four electron domains, you have a structure now that is no longer planar. When it sits on your hand, you have um, an atom that, that central atom is slightly raised, and then you have another atom that's pointing straight up. What is hard to see on paper is that this is actually a 109.5 degree bond angle between these atoms. What's really confusing is when we draw it, what you'll see, and I'll pretend it's methane, what you'll see on paper is you'll see people draw this structure that looks flat. But in real life, Methane does not look like this. Methane is not in the plane of the page. What happens is the atoms, the hydrogen atoms, are going to, one of them is going to go behind the plane of the page, and one of them is going to come out at you where the 
wedge bond is coming out at you, the dashed bonds going behind the plane of the page so that we can help illustrate that 109.5 degree bond angle. Because the most common mistake, at least when you're in general chemistry, is to call methane's bond angle 90 degrees because it looks like it's 90 degrees when you draw it on the page like that. But when we draw it with the wedge and the dash bonds, it becomes a little bit more lifted out of the page and you can have a mental cue that's like, oh, that's not 90 degrees, right? That's, that's the one that's that silly bond angle, that 109.5. What do we call this electron pair geometry? We call it tetrahedral. A tetrahedron is something that has four faces and it's hard to see if you're not actually touching a model, but if you look at um, the tetrahedral structure that's on my hand right now, my hand would be considered one face where those three bottom atoms touch is one face. And there's three other faces that are gonna be probably hard to illustrate in the camera, but one is here and one is here and one is here and then the one that my hand was on. It makes a tetrahedron if you connect all of those exterior atoms. Remember that when you don't have any lone pairs on the central atom, that your molecular shape is the same as the electron pair geometry, still tetrahedral. And then the bond angle, 109.5. For your hybridization, because you have four electron domains, you need an S, a P, a P, and a P. So you need four orbitals to go in to satisfy your four electron domains. So you have sp3 hybridization. Now let's look at the other shapes that have four electron domains. Now with this one, we've taken one of the bonded pairs and we've replaced it with a lone pair. In my structure, again, I have my central atom. My lone pair is this big red bulb. And that lone pair is being illustrated on the diagram on your page right here. And I just tried to draw a bulb around it to say, remember, that takes up a lot of space. You still have four electron domains. And because you have four electron domains, your electron pair geometry is still tetrahedral. When you look at your electron pair geometry, your lone pairs and your bonded electron domains end up getting counted the same. So you're looking at how the electron sets are distributed over the central atom. But for the molecular shape, remember that if we take this structure and, oops, and we have this lone pair up here, this lone pair, it takes up space. But if we take that atomic picture, that lone pair doesn't show up in the atomic picture. What shows up is the atoms, and that's what we're looking for for our shape. For our shape, I'm gonna put this on my hand so that you can see that the middle atom, the central atom, it does not touch my palm. It is slightly elevated. This is not planar. It actually makes a shallow pyramid. And so we're gonna have the word pyramidal in here. And if I connect my red atoms again, it makes a triangle. So this is called trigonal pyramid or trigonal pyramidal. If you're in my class, it doesn't matter if you call it pyramid or pyramidal, it's the same thing. As for your bond angle, because it's based off of four electron domains, you are going to still have a bond angle that's pretty darn similar to 109.5 degrees. But remember that that lone pair, it takes up a whole bunch of space. It makes these bonds come a little bit closer together. So it's gonna be about 109.5, but technically a little bit less than 109.5. And if you really wanted to memorize a new bond angle, it's right around 107. For the hybridization, because you have four electron domains, remember you need to have four equivalent hybrid orbitals. So you take four of your regular old atomic orbitals and you mix them. So you take the S, the P, the P, and the P, and you hybridize them to get SP3 hybridization.
All right, here's our last shape. Now, if you were in general chemistry, we would go on to five and six electron domains. But in organic chemistry, we get to stick with four electron domains because almost everything that we're dealing with has two, three, or four electron domains. In this example, we still have four electron domains because we have four groups of electrons around that central atom. Our groups are this set, this set, this one, and this one. They are going to spread out so they are as far apart from each other as possible. And if we look at how all of the pairs of electrons spread out, they end up in a tetrahedral structure. If we consider just how the atoms are arranged, then we look at the shape. The shape is going to be bent because look at how we have one, two, three atoms and they're in this bent shape. You might be thinking, wait a second, we already had a bent. Yeah, I know. Some people might call this distorted tetrahedral because they don't like to have two bents, but um, I like to just stick with bent because usually you're asked more information than just the shape so that you can help uh, recognize if the student knows that you're talking about the four electron domain version of bent or the three electron domain version of bent. For example, if you ask the shape and the bond angle, this bond angle is going to be based off of that 109.5 degree bond angle because there's four electron domains. Now you have one, two lone pairs that are taking up even more space than if you just had one lone pair. And so these atoms come closer together. And so again, it's, you know, about 109.5. Realistically, it's less than 109.5. And water is a great example of this, which has a bond angle of about 104. For your hybridization, remember you have four electron domains, so you need four equivalent orbitals. You have to start at the s orbital, hybridize that along with your 3p orbitals in order to get four equivalent orbitals with a hybridization of sp3. Now we've wrapped up Vesper theory. We're gonna go ahead and move into molecule polarity, but if you need a break, go ahead and pause right now because it's a good time to take a break. So before we can talk about molecule polarity, we need to talk about polar covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are where electrons are shared and polar bonds are where their electrons are shared unequally. This ends up happening when there is a significant difference in the electronegativity values of two atoms. Let's remind ourselves what electronegativity is. Electronegativity is a numerical value representing the tendency of an element to pull electrons toward itself in a covalent bond. So if atoms had feelings, what they would do for electronegativity is the atoms with the higher electronegativities would have a desire or a want to have electrons close to them. So if you kind of think of it like a tug of war, if you have an HF bond, the fluorine's more electronegative, and so it's going to pull the electrons in the bond toward itself. And polarity is not like black and white, right? Bonding and polarity are a continuum. So over here on the left-hand side, when your difference in electronegativity, where remember, uh, delta is difference, that's the capital letter delta, which is essentially a triangle. And EN I'm abbreviating as electronegativity. So when your difference in electronegativity is zero, all the way to 0 0.4, we consider that range to be nonpolar. Then once the difference hits 0 0.5, this is where we consider polar bonds to start. And then the end point of polar bonds changes depending upon what textbook you're in. Some textbooks I've seen end polar bonds at 1.7 difference in electronegativity. 
I've seen some textbooks do 1.9 and I've seen some textbooks do 2.0. <sighs> I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I guess just pick one. Let's do 1.9. Once we hit 1.9 or 1.7 or 2.0, depending upon what your textbook says, that is where we have our cutoff for polar covalent bonds. And then once you hit 2.0, then that's where we get to ionic. So our polar and our nonpolar section, so this area and this area, these are covalent bonds polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. And then once you get uh, to a certain point, you have something that's so polar it's ionic, right? Because polar is just an unequal distribution of electrons where one side is partially negative and one side is partially positive. Let's look at that idea a little bit more. For a polar bond, what we can do is we can look at the electronegativity values. So hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1, and chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0. I do not have those memorized, right? They are down here in the bottom right-hand corner in this table. And I am not going to ask you to memorize them. If you see me know them, it's because I use them all the time. We have a difference of 0.9, and that makes this a polar bond. So what's happening is the chlorine is much more electronegative than the hydrogen. And it's taking those electrons in the bond and it's pulling it toward itself. Like if it's playing tug of war, the chlorine is winning. And when it pulls those electrons toward itself, what happens is that the chlorine then develops a partial negative. So the fancy S is a lowercase delta and it means partial. So it makes a partial negative and your hydrogen ends up with a lack of electrons, which leaves it having a partial positive. Another way to write this is with an arrow. So what we'll do is we'll have an arrow pointing to the element that has the higher electronegativity, and then on the other side of the arrow, where the arrow starts, we'll put a little cross right there to, to say the hydrogen is positive, partially positive, and the chlorine is pulling the electrons toward itself. This idea of the chlorine pulling the electrons in that bond toward itself, this is called induction or electron withdrawal. We're going to talk more about induction as the semester goes on. When these elements are in a situation where one is pulling electron density toward itself, and creates this partial positive and partial negative. This partial positive and negative is called a dipole, right? Like di is two, poles is positives and negatives. And when you have a dipole, you can actually measure how, how big that difference in partial positive and negative is, and that's what a dipole moment is. Uh, in our particular class, we will not do calculations with dipole moments. Um, you can save that when you change your major to chemistry. Let's go ahead and look at these two molecules here, and let's identify the polar bonds in these molecules. And then we'll start bringing in the idea of, hey, we know how to identify a polar bond, we know what a polar bond is, but how do we decide if a molecule is polar? I want you to pause me for a moment and give yourself an opportunity to look at the electronegativity chart on the right-hand side, look at these molecules, and decide which bonds are polar. All right, hopefully you paused me and you recognized that the CO bond is polar, the OH bond is polar, and the CF bond is polar. Each of these bonds have an electronegativity difference that's greater than 0.5. Well, 0.5 or greater, right? Because 0.4, it's still nonpolar. So CH with a 0.4 difference is nonpolar. Once you hit 0.5, that's when it starts to become polar. One of the things that we can do is start to draw in the arrows, and I like the arrows because I think that it makes it a little bit easier to see. Um, the other thing that I like about the arrows is because uh, people have taken physics before, they can kind of see them as vectors, and they can do a little bit better with, um, with them because of that. I'm going to draw in my arrows showing my direction of polarity. I've identified the polar bonds in these molecules. 
how do we decide if a molecule is polar? And that's what we're going to work on next. Now, when I give you this molecule polarity flowchart, I want to have a stipulation here. About half the chemists that I've met are uh, in one polarity camp. They believe one thing about polarity. And the other half of the chemists believe something different about polarity. You have to be really careful with online resources because you don't know the person who's delivering that online resource, which group they sit in. So I'm in the group that when we end up calling something polar, it needs to be really stinking polar for us to call it polar. It can't be a little teensy bit polar. That is represented in my flowchart. I also want you to know that this flowchart only works for organic chemistry. There is a couple of stipulations in general chemistry where you get into five and six electron domains where this flowchart will fail you. This is for um, a certain group of people who believe about polarity just in organic chemistry. But if you're in my class, use this flowchart. How can a beginner tell if a molecule is polar? Well, first of all, what we need is we need our molecule to have polar bonds. Here are the requirements. We have to have polar bonds. We have to have an asymmetrical structure. And the problem that ends up happening is people don't understand what asymmetrical structure means. And that's why I made the flow chart. There's two ways to have an asymmetrical structure. One way is to have your outer atoms not be the same electronegativity. That will uh, create an asymmetrical structure. The other way is to have a lone pair on your central atom. That will create an asymmetrical structure. So there's an order of operations to here, right? First, you have to have polar bonds for the molecule to be even considered to be polar. And then you have to look at the asymmetrical structure. Let's follow our flowchart. We're gonna start up here and then you'll follow the yes and no questions. On the next slide, I have an example that I want us to go through. What we wanna do is determine if carbon tetrachloride is polar or nonpolar. It might be helpful to have the Lewis structure. So if you need to, to determine polarity, if you don't have the Lewis structure kind of in your mind, then draw it out. Because we're probably at a point right now where we do need to draw out the Lewis structure. So we're gonna ask ourselves first, start here, are, the pol are there polar bonds present? We look at our electronegativity chart. Carbon is 2.5, chlorine is 3.0. They have a difference of 0.5, and yes, our bonds are polar. Are all the outer atoms identical? Okay, what that means is do I have chlorine, 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 chlorine? Because really the heart of that is asking, do all of these atoms that are my outer atoms have the same electronegativity value? So are my outer atoms identical? Yep. And do I have lone pair on the central atom, one or more? And the answer here is no. I have lone pairs on the chlorine, but I do not have lone pairs on the carbon. Therefore, this is a nonpolar molecule. Let's look at another example. So this one's a little bit different, CH2Cl2. I'm going to draw it with my wedge and dash bonds to get you in practice. Are there polar bonds present? Yes, carbon chlorine is polar just like it was on the last slide. Carbon hydrogen has a difference of 0.4 nonpolar. So I'm starting here. Are my polar bonds or are there polar bonds present? Yes. Are our all the outer atoms identical? Well, no. Two of them are chlorine and two of them are hydrogen. And so that automatically makes this a polar molecule whether there's lone pairs on the central atom or not. Because if you think of it again like a tug of war, two of the atoms are pulling electrons toward themselves where the other two are just hanging out, sharing electrons equally. 
two of the electron atoms are pulling electrons toward themselves, that area is developing more negative uh, charge. And that's what a pole is. It's one area that's partially negative and one area that's partially positive. All right, I want you to try this last one. So pause and then we'll compare. Hopefully you gave it a try. You probably needed the Lewis structure for water first. And then you have to go through and start up at the top. Are there polar bonds present? Well, yes, oxygen, hydrogen is polar. Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1, uh, oxygen 3.5. So that is a 1.4 difference, so this is a polar bond. Are the outer atoms identical? So you have your oxygen as your central atom, you have two hydrogens, yes. You have two hydrogens, you have the same outer atom. Are there lone pairs on the central atom? Why, yes, there are. So this is a polar molecule. Now, one of the things that throws people is if you misdraw water and you draw the Lewis structure like this, then it looks like your hydrogens are opposite and your lone pairs are opposite. But they're not really opposite in real life because in real life, it looks like this. This is not a linear structure, this is a bent structure. So what you have is an excess of electron density up here, and your oxygen is pulling electrons away from the hydrogen, creating partial positive down here. So you have a partial positive here, and you have a partial negative up here. This is absolutely a polar molecule. Let's wrap up. In this video, we talked about the geometry and the molecular shape around atoms. You want to be able to look at any molecule, and even if it doesn't have one clear central atom, determine the shape and the geometry around that particular atom. You also want to be able to determine the bond angle around that atom as well as that atom's hybridization. Then we also want to be able to tell if small molecules can be deemed polar or nonpolar using our polarity flowchart. Thanks so much for your attention. This is Katoni signing out. I don't know how to spell tendency. How do you spell tendency? Tendency is spelled T-E-N-D-E-N-C-Y. Cool, I was going to be right.